thank you all for uh, coming. The Mitchell brothers for being such great hosts. Uh, and thank you both for, for being with us. Like many journalists who are here this summer uh, for the Democratic Convention, I think I was equally, I'm sorry, the Republican Convention. <laughs> uh, apologies, apologies. Yeah, I was say. Um, I was, I was equally, equally part of impressed and surprised by all of the signs of renewal uh, that, we, uh, that we saw. Nothing against Philadelphia, speaking of the Democratic Convention, but I think the most common phrase I heard three days into the Democratic Convention was, I miss Cleveland. Um, so I'm interested in asking to start, what do each of you see as the most positive, obviously there are still many challenges, we're gonna talk about them, but what are the most positive trends you see happening in your city? Well, it, it, the intangible thing of hope is always uh, a driving factor. And, and um, when you look at uh, our greatest asset is really the people. And what I found during the Republican National Convention is that what impressed our visitors the most was the friendliness of the people. Uh, they not only said hello, but they said, what can I do for you? And, and those are the kind of things that uh, uh, really set the image and the tone of a city. You have to start with hope, and you have to uh, uh, start with people, and, and we have to invest in them. Is the hope something recent, something new? No, I think uh, that's what carried us through the most difficult time. Uh, people are always pleasantly surprised when they come to Cleveland. Uh, one of the reasons that I believe we won the Republican National Convention is because people still believe about that old image of Cleveland. But Clevelanders know the difference. Mm -hmm. We know the difference. And so we, uh, we fly under the radar, and, and people underestimate us. And uh, for doing that, they lose. Dr. Cosgrove? No, I think uh, Frank has hit it exactly right. I think the, the people of Cleveland uh, ha, I, are the biggest asset, and I uh, feel that the hope and the enthusiasm and the positiveness is escalating uh, here as we see one little victory and another and another and another. And obviously, you know, we've had several really dramatic victories, but these are all things that are a result of what's been building up over the years. Mr. Mayor, in your, in your State of the City address this year, you said something that I have heard versions of in many of the cities we have been to in this project, uh, from the mayors of places as different as Cleveland and Austin and Denver and Atlanta. You said, unfortunately, the benefits of economic growth and investments are not felt evenly across the city. <clears throat> the traditional model of economic development tools and programs simply does not work for every neighborhood. So what are the most important things you have learned about extending the signs of renewal and growth that you are seeing in some areas of Cleveland to all areas of Cleveland? Uh, the most important thing <coughs> is not to just talk about it, you have to do something about it. And so we, what we've done is uh, we are no longer in the debate or in the philosophical discussion mm -hmm. as to why those things happen. We just look at what can we do to make the change. Uh, whether it's uh, investing in education, reform, uh, continuing education beyond the 12th grade, uh, looking at uh, when there's economic development, if in fact there's direct benefit to the people who live in the city of Cleveland, and, and if it's not to the individual, to companies, local companies that hire people mm -hmm. who live in the city of Cleveland. So how do, we, how do we ensure that this prosperity and this quality of life is, is really shared by everyone? because that is the true measure of a great city. Uh, it is not uh, buildings or the economy, because those things will come and go. And if you don't invest in people, and if you don't have a sustainable process where people are the beneficiary of that prosperity and that quality of life, then it will end. How would you describe the degree of success that you feel of channeling more of the, of the growth well, more it, widely through the community? It's, it's always a struggle because <clears throat> The system's not set up for that group of people. Uh, uh, whether you're uh, uh, based on race or based on barriers, like the young man said, mm -hmm. coming out of prison, uh, many other factors. It's just not set up for that. So you're always working against the system. You're always pushing upstream. You're always pushing upstream. And when you, uh, you know when you're successful, though, because the system will then uh, undermine your success. Uh, uh, it, it, a primary example, uh, we have a local hiring law that mm -hmm. we've had for uh, 12 years. It's been yeah. very successful. 
and, and then we get state uh, government who then makes it illegal for us to enforce our local hiring. So what they've done is that they have not said that you cannot invest or you cannot create an environment for investment in wealth. What they said is this group of people can benefit from it. Yeah, let, let me come back, I'm gonna come back to that, but let me, let me ask Dr. Cosgrove, because the Greater University Circle Initiative that, that you have been part of since 2005 is clearly one of the most systematic efforts anywhere in the country to leverage the uh, private economic power of local anchor institutions. In this case, it's the Cleveland Clinic, the University Hospitals, and Case Western Reserve. I've read you collectively employ 60,000 people, spend about three billion annually on goods and services. Uh, the, you have tried to target that on revitalizing the areas around you, around the mantra of live, buy, and hire locally. What have you achieved, and maybe just as important, what have you learned about the limits of what you can achieve as private sector actors to revitalize well, your community? I yeah, I, first of all, I don't see any limits. <laughs> the, the limits right. are just a matter of time and effort. Uh, and, but what we have seen is we've reached out into the community, uh, we have brought uh, people into the community and living around that area and really revitalize the living of it. We've in, improved the safety of, of that particular area and we've brought jobs to that area. I mean, if you look at the Cleveland Clinic, I look at there's three things that we need to do. We need to provide great health care. We need to provide great jobs and there's 30,000 of them here in Cleveland. And if you look across uh, Northeast Ohio, that's over uh, 80,000 jobs that are affected one way or another across this. Including area. suppliers or? Yeah. The whole, whole chain. The whole chain. Right. And then the third thing is we're big believers in education. Frank led the way. Um, and what we did is we uh, merged ourselves in John Hay High School. Um, and interestingly, John Hay High School is now gone to the fact that 100% of the kids graduating from there go on to college. Mm -hmm. And they go on to great colleges. Um, and we've, we've uh, partnered up with uh, the other institutions there and with the Cleveland Foundation and we have given uh, secured mortgages for people to move into the homes around mm -hmm. the area. We've uh, invested uh, heavily in taking down abandoned homes in that community. We've got a wonderful partnership with uh, Fairfax community. Um, and so I see this whole area uh, really coming back uh, on the basis of those three, uh, three things. Any institution like yours, one of the biggest impacts on the community is in the hiring, is in the employment. Yes. Roughly how many people do you hire a year, do you know? Uh, you, I can't you tell you here, but we have a total of, uh, f across the entire organ uh, organization, 50,000. And to what extent can you find, do you find the people you need each year from Cleveland, and to what extent are you importing talent? Well, we always look for the best talent, but the vast majority of the people that we hire are coming from right here in Cleveland. They are. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we feel so strongly about supporting education. Uh, because if we didn't, it's the knowledge economy now, and you gotta be knowledgeable and educated to have a great job, and we need great uh, employees to, to run a great organization. What's the, educa what's the educational requirement level for most of the jobs that you Well, hire? we take people that some of them don't even have high school education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, um, is that the bulk though, or is the bulk require beyond, uh, beyond well, 12 usually? Well, we've got 20,000 nurses, for yeah, example, right. which is, uh, you know, two-fifths of our organization. L let me come back to the education reform in just one moment. But let me ask you, uh, you know, jumping off from that, Mr. Mayor, when you kind of think about the future job growth of Cleveland, where, wh what kind of industries? Where do you think, or is it in Ed's and Med's future, as they sometimes talk about for former manufacturing? Wh where, where do you see the, the growth in the future coming? Well, I don't think we can exclude anything. And so once we begin to narrow and, and, and say that we're focusing on this and, and mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're creating a problem for ourselves, as Dr. Crossgrove is, is saying, everything comes together and you need it all in order to be successful. You need great education. <clears throat> right now we have a very strong medical industry and all those associate uh, companies and, and, mm -hmm. and vendors around mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, there's the whole ideal of advanced manufacturing around technology. Uh, we want to move into the area of sustainability and alternative energy and create Cleveland as a, a, as a hub. We already, in this region, uh, manufacture component parts to wind turbines. So how do we then now uh, begin to assemble them, export that technology, export? Uh, we want to um, be an exporter of things not just a consumer of things. 
And so it, it, we have to uh, accept whatever comes. We have mm -hmm. to be flexible enough to accept whatever comes and identify what that is at that time. Because at any given time, right. what is the least important will become the most important. So let me answer what seems to be the obvious next question. To what extent are both the young people and the working age adults in Cleveland equipped with the skills and the education to compete for the jobs you are creating in the city? Mm -hmm. And to what extent do you find that you have to, that employers tell you they have to import talent to fill the jobs, even as many of your residents are getting by without sufficiently steady work? Well, I, I will tell you that if, uh, I imagine in almost every urban center you have yep. this, this dynamic right. going on where you have thousands of jobs opening and, and, and no one to fill it. So in those areas, you do have to import. You do have mm. to import. But if we create policy and we create uh, a demand for local labor, local skill sets or whatever that may be, by creating an economy that invests in itself, we buy goods and services from ourselves. We begin to do those things mm -hmm. that uh, will sustain our economy and keep it more flat rather than going through the ebbs and flow of a, a national economy, then, then the better off we will be. And, and the mayor has been really good at uh, driving us and encouraging us to hire locally, to mm -hmm begin to mentor local industries, uh, for example, the construction industry. Um, we st uh, and goods and products, so we, we buy about $2 billion worth of goods and services annually. 20% of that comes from Northeast mm -hmm. Ohio. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, as you mentioned before, I mean, an important part of connecting the community to the growth <laughs> is equipping the, the mm -hmm. people who grow up here with the skills to compete for the jobs. And you are in the midst of a major education reform effort of several years now called the Cleveland Plan. And you are facing kind of a, a you know, a report card test on the ballot this fall when voters are deciding whether to uh, extend the property tax increase that you imposed, I think, in 2012. Right. So let me start with, uh, with um, uh, uh, Dr. Cosgrove. The levy is not trivial. Um, uh, I've read it costs property owners $459 per $100,000 in home value. Has the city shown that it deserves the money? Absolutely. I mean, you see renewal across the city all over the place. You see the city that is sparked uh, from the, the renewal. The renewal has brought more infrastructure. You know, we are, I think uh, the mayor will tell you that we have an infrastructure here that needs a lot of help uh, across the city, whether, whether it's roads or whether it's sewers or all of the infrastructure across our, our city. And um, we have shown tremendous progress. You can feel it, you can see it, you can drive on it. And you know we just need to keep it going and it's gonna require that we build the infrastructure to go with it. What's the report card you would give the Cleveland plan at this point? Well, if, if anybody, if you're expecting to see um, uh, complete change and, mm -hmm. and, and, and complete enlightenment in four years, it's not gonna happen. This is work. You have, to, you, have to, you have to put the work in. If, 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 if we put politics in and BS in, that's what you get on the outside. <laughs> you get politics and BS on the outside. So we're actually doing work. And, and it's hard work. And, and it's hard work because of who we serve. Yeah. And who we serve are, are traditionally uh, people and the children of people who have been left out of the prosperity left out of quality of life. So there's different types of challenges and different types of obstacles that you have to deal with. Now there's some basics that apply to all human beings, but when you add layers of other stuff, then, then it becomes more challenging. But uh, what is a challenge but to, but to meet it, right? Yeah. So, so that's what we do. You know, now, but right, the one sure. thing I want to yeah. mention to you, uh, and I always have to mention this, yeah. by the way, is that I do not believe in education as uh, just for to create employees. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not believe that we should be educating people just to fill a job market. We should educate an individual, a child, so that that child is a whole child, that they can make good life decisions. And it just so happens that you get a good employee out of that. But, but if we narrow that into saying we just want to educate on this and make it a good employee, 
or, or a field, a job demands. We're, we're not going to be successful. I want to. I want to go back to one thing you, you talked about in, in your answer about the, one of the challenges you face about you know reaching students in communities that have been mm -hmm. left out. Analysis that we've done at the Atlantic with the Policy Link organization, uh, we've looked at kind of the uh, the patterns in school attendance really around the country, and in Cleveland, like many major cities. Uh, a significant majority of both African American and Hispanic students attend schools where most of their classmates qualify as poor or low income. They are, they are in schools of concentrated poverty. Is it possible to get the educational gains that you want for kids without expanding economic opportunity for adults? It, uh, it's possible to get advancement. Whether it is holistic and sustainable, you need it all. Mm -hmm. Um, and that maybe goes to the next uh, area. You have, in addition to the property tax increase, you have on the ballot this fall uh, a, a um, half, half, percent, half percentage point increase in the city income tax to raise $80 million. What's the case to the city for doing that, Dr. Cosgrove? Well, I think the case for the city is very clear. We need to support the schools. We need to support the infrastructure. We need to build uh, this city back up so that we can uh, continue to have great growth here and attract people. I mean, I think you saw as you came here for the convention, you know, the, the area that we have built a convention center, we have built uh, a, and this, by the way, is a, a whole community. Mm -hmm. We do downtown, uh, there's more people living downtown, what, 18,000 people living town, downtown? 15,000. 15, 15,000. Yeah. Right. Uh, living downtown. Uh, this is this is new, and and this is continuing to feed itself. Uh, I just think that you know we can't afford not to uh, support this uh, as we go forward. Be being a you know political hack in my day job, I, I want to ask you: uh, Do you worry at all that having two different tax uh, measures on the ballot at the same time will increase the chances that neither pass? Well, in a scared man, to get you killed. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we're afraid to take a risk, if we're afraid to address the challenges before us, then we might as well just go home and just let whatever happens happen. But let me put, a con yeah. let me put yeah. this in a context. Sure. Uh, the school levy is, is not an increase, mm -hmm. it's a renewal, mm -hmm. and we did that on purpose. We did not ask for a permanent levy in 2012 because we wanted to be held accountable. Uh, I actually uh, wanted that accountability to occur in my next term so that, so that I wouldn't blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, this is the accountability side. It measures two things. D do the, uh, have we done a reasonable job? And do the people have hope and confidence that we're moving in the right direction? So that's what this vote is about. It's not about any extra money because it's a renewal. Now, the income tax is different. It is a half a percent increase. Now, the only good tax is the one you don't pay. <laughs> the, the next best tax is the one that you pay and you get something for. What this does, this allows us to raise enough money to become structurally balanced and to have enough money left over so we can purchase additional service. We're not a private sector, so we don't do things mm. for profit. We're government, and we do, our bottom line is service, not profit. Our ability to deliver the level of service that people should have should have is not there right now. Now, I, I can mm. go through a long yeah. litany of reason why, but let me just say this. Uh, give you an example. Uh, since the recession, in income tax alone, we have gone, f uh, we probably have gone f about $50 million of increase in income tax. That shows you that there's uh, prosperity, uh, people are working, uh, with those who are working are paying, uh, companies are making profit, but I'm still at a recession level in terms of revenue. revenue. So those are state policy and other policies that put restrictions mm. on us. If it were not for those restrictions and those impediments, then we would not be asking for half a percent. I want to ask two more questions and then bring in the audience uh, to, to uh, weigh in. Your youth violence prevention plan. Um, I want to ask you the same question, really, I asked you about education. As you think about reducing violence in the community, what, how big a piece of the pie are changing in policing tactics and law enforcement, and how big a piece of the pie is increasing opportunity? All of it. All of it? All of it. 
uh, and I will say this. Um, uh, uh, you have, you, people have to feel as if they're part of something in order to protect the integrity of that something. If they feel that they're not part of it or is of no benefit to them, then what do they care about what happens to it? So you have to, that's the whole point about uh, bringing people mm -hmm. into prosperity, bringing people into quality of life, because then that group of people will defend whatever that, that thing is. The other side to it is that when you do that, if you provide a great education, and like I say, not just for a job, but the whole individual, mm -hmm. you provide a, a, a job opportunity and an entrepreneur opportunity where people can provide for themselves and their family. Uh, crime, will, you can see crime reduce, I, I would just say half overnight, mm -hmm. overnight. Then that becomes very clear as to what you do about the law enforcement side. And when you're dealing with law enforcement, uh, we live in an urban center. We do not live in, in uh, a Mayberry kind of mm -hmm. city. So that means that there is going to have to be aggressive policing. The question is whether or not aggressive policing is constitutional, whether it's respectful, and whether or not a, a, a appropriate force is used in, in, in dealing with the criminal element. But we cannot just assume that, uh, that we don't have issues out here and that the people who the police deal with are, are, are not aggressive people. They are aggressive people. Yeah, I think there's a very nice opportunity to also give opportunities, particularly to young people. And, you know, one of the things that we've done is we reached out into the community and provide summer employment. Uh, and we have a couple of hundred high school students now, a uh, hundred of whom we are mentoring uh, starting in their freshman year in high school who are really at-risk students. And we think we can see tremendous opportunities because we do two things. We give them structure to their lives. Uh, and secondly, we introduce them to a market, a business, a industry that there's going to be a tremendous number of jobs down the road. Uh, and we've seen students go from that summer job through college and then into our medical school and then now join our faculty. Let me follow up one thing and then bring in the audience. Uh, reading through that violence prevention plan, it was clear it envisions a major role for partnerships with nonprofit organizations of all sorts, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Healthy Cleveland, Invest in Children. Dr. Cosgrove, how do you rate here the kind of the, 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 um, the quality, the state of the civic sector, the level of engagement from the business community, the level of vitality of the nonprofit sector? I th you know, I think the nonprofit sector has been very, very uh, engaged. I take the Cleveland Foundation, for example, one of the first and biggest foundations in the country, and they have uh, supported all sorts of activities across our community for 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, uh, they have been terrific. Uh, I think you see the private sector increasingly engaged, uh, and, I, and I think uh, the mayor would agree with that. Uh, but, you know, how you measure it on a scale of 1 to 100, I really can't, can't comment. Do you have the community engagement you need from your side? Uh, you can always have more. Mm -hmm. you can always <laughs> Absolutely. Have more. But, but let, me, let me point out one thing, and it's a very important element that people really don't talk about, but I believe it's a core. When you talk about policing and you talk about uh, how do uh, uh, the economic development and the participation of it, what people normally leave out is the, is the third leg to that stool, which I think is the most important one, and that is true empowerment. And, and, and which means that uh, this, we have to allow for people to be empowered, to be empowered politically, economically, and socially to determine for themselves and provide for themselves. Once you do that, then you, you get a whole different approach to life. If, you, if we continue to have groups of people dependent on, on us in order for their survival, or depending on us to uh, navigate the politics of it or the social mm -hmm. condition, then we're going to always fail. We're going to always fail. Because uh, even though people may be poor, and even though many people may ha not have uh, 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 the kind of education that we need in today, uh, they're not foolish. They're not foolish. And, and, and if we fail to, uh, if we continue in the same mode of, of talking about these things and allowing the other two, but, but deny true empowerment to people, 
then this will never go anywhere. We'll be right back in this cycle again and again and again. Audience, one right up here. Hold on, hold on, wait, there's a microphone coming. Hi. Hello. Uh, so I wanted to address one of the components around education. Um, both Dr. Cosgrove and Mayor Jackson uh, touched on it around having to be knowledgeable to get a great job um, and um, sort of depending on, on the government for success. Um, but we're also talking about a city where just last week two of them closed because it was so hot. Right. It wouldn't have been an environment where anyone would be able to teach or learn. So even as we're talking about creating systems where people mm -hmm. are empowered or able to succeed or even given opportunities later in life, mm -hmm. we're talking about at the very fundamental time of their, of their development um, being literally kicked out of school because it's not an environment mm -hmm. where they can learn. Well, you, you have a couple of things going. Um, first of all, if, if um, um, I know people who have struggled through much more difficult things and have achieved success in terms of education. And so uh, just putting it on the condition of the school as an impediment or, the, or not that you said this, but as an excuse as to why is it to me doesn't is not sufficient but at the same time we need to as a system as as government and as a you know as our society we need to eliminate those things and and which means our investments should be around that it should be around that to create a kind of environment that makes it more conducive but at the same time i've seen people overcome many many challenges uh, to in order and have achieved much more. And, um, and I'm sorry to be long-winded about this, but mm -hmm. I, I, uh, uh, I, when I talk to um, kids, usually younger ones, and I, I always give them this little analogy. I say, now, if, if, um, if, if your parent asks you to go to the store, buy a loaf of bread so you can bring it back, and she's going to make you a sandwich so you can eat, is that difficult? No. If your parent asks you to go to the store, buy a loaf of bread so you can come back and make a sandwich so you can eat, but you're blind, does that make it difficult? Yes. So they both accomplish the same thing. But who among the two is the most achieving and who would be the greater of the two? So I actually see the challenges as in people who overcome them as, 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 as people who create leadership and direction that, that they would not normally have because life does train you that way. But at the same time, uh, we, we do have an obligation to make it as less challenging as we can. And, and we fail many times, we fail. But that is part of what we do because we're not perfect. And, and so uh, we passed the facility levy in 2014 when we pass the facility level. We're building new schools that have air conditioning now. But it is a process. It is, and, and, and it's not always fair. So we have another uh, question in the, uh, the audience, because I've got two more. Uh, we've got one over here, yep. Oh, back there? Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll get you in. Mayor, Toby, uh, Ron, yeah, really appreciate your leadership. I have a question for you, Mayor Jackson, about um, the court system. With, with the consent decree right now, we're reforming the, the work of the police department, and you've made great progress uh, with, the, with Eric Gordon and, and all the, the teachers and educators under him with the education, uh, with public education in Cleveland. The court system, I had a conversation recently with a judge who talked about overcharging, rampant overcharging and plea deals that wind out, that the upshot of which is that somebody with a, who's charged with a second degree felony pleads out to three misdemeanors after eight weeks in jail and he's lost his job. And he said that happens in 30 courtrooms every day. Right. How much of that, how, how concerned are you about that and those sorts of things undermining the renewal work that's, that, that you're achieving? Well, first of all, uh, don't be surprised as if this is new. This, is, this has been going on for decades and probably a couple of centuries. And, and, and depending on who you are, because it's never uh, what happens that matters, it's always about who it's happening to. 
and when it happens to this group, it's not as important as it when it happens to that group. So, but, but my point is that even when we were looking at the findings in the, in the, by the Department of Justice, my major concern, one of my major concerns with those findings is that it didn't go far enough and address the criminal justice system as a whole. And, and whenever you address the system as a whole, you will find that the police are the easiest ones to deal with because they're the ones involved in whatever the direct uh, complaints are or, or problems are. But if you look at the, the systemic issue of the criminal justice system, you will find that it is not fair and it's not just to many people and, and it tends to be more that way with certain groups of people. So yes, you have to be concerned about it. And, and, and it's not just a concern that, that has come up now. People raise it now as if it's new. It's not new. It's been part of the civil rights movement, part of before the civil rights movement in the 60s. It was, it was discussed during segregation. It was discussed during Jim Crowism. It was discussed through all those times. So this is not a new thing. That's why I said, if you really want to have sustainable progress and sustainable, uh, uh, positive things happen in any city. You have to invest in people, and essential to that is that you have to not only have prosperity and, 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 and quality of life, you also have to have fairness and justice and, all, and equity of all the system in regards to everybody. Let's, that is where we fail. Let's squeeze in one last question. Thank you, I'll try to be concise. So I appreciate the theme that we've been on related to renewal, and I was wondering if we could bring the conversation of wages into the context of this. That's something that's very real in terms of um, a vote that's coming up in our own council and what that means in terms of shared prosperity. So if either of you could yeah. please comment on well, that, I think, I appreciate I think the vote already occurred, uh, which was against the $15 minimum wage just in Cleveland. Now, because I don't think anybody in council, I know not in my administration, uh, is opposed to increasing minimum wage. But we are, I know I am, opposed to anything that would say just Cleveland. Because if in fact, uh, if this is a suburb, this is a suburb, and they're paying uh, half the wage that I'm required to pay, then I'm moving my business here or there. So what it does is it causes uh, 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 a lack of new investment because who would invest where you know your labor costs would be twice as high and then it would cause disinvestment because these two entrepreneurs will go somewhere else right across the street not in Cleveland and ultimately it will result in unemployment and a reduction of service now let me point out to you that um, uh, the issue is is being portrayed as if it is about the poor, if it, as, as, as if it's about those who are less fortunate. This is a political agenda in a political year. Uh, the Democrats are doing that. Now on the Republican side, I got them eliminating our ability to hire local on billions of dollars of development. So the Republicans will say, you can keep your development, but this group can't benefit from it. On the Democratic side, they will say, well, everybody should have a high wage and we'll just stop development. So, so I have to, so it's not the opposition of minimum wage. It is not even opposition to $15. It could be $20 for all I care. Only Ooh. thing I'm saying is don't put me at a disadvantage in terms of economic growth and investment. And that's what this will do. Do you want to weigh in real quick, Dr. Cosgrove? Yeah, well, one of the things we do is I think that we have increased the minimum wage at the Cleveland Clinic to $12 voluntarily. And we had 20,000 of our 50,000 employees who had their pay scales lifted last year. And so we want to be competitive for great workers. And that's one of the ways that you right. do it. We're basically through here. But this is a year evenly divisible by four. So I would be remiss if I let you get off stage before right. asking you. Will Hillary Clinton get the numbers she needs, particularly in the African-American community, out of Cleveland? Well, I, I would predict yes. Uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it is some work to be done because uh, uh, when you people are um, 
uh, left out for so long and, and hopes are dashed so often. Uh, you know, it takes a little work to kind of get them back up to want to do it. But I will also say that I believe this is, will be the last election uh, for uh, anything where people will be taken for granted and people would be accepted for taking for granted. That's interesting. Join me in thanking Mayor Jackson, Dr. Cosgrove. Great panel. Thank you both. Really appreciate it.